All right, we're going to do a video going through a common Calvinistic argument that you like using in favor of limited atonement. And what this heresy of limited atonement in Calvinism is, it, pretty much all Calvinistic heresies stem from their denial of free will. And for, at limited atonement, it goes hand in hand with the unconditional election. And they'll say basically that Jesus Christ didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect. And only the elect are, you know, have the basically salvation available to them. And some of them will give lip service to Jesus Christ dying for everybody because it's taught all throughout the New Testament that this that basically he, he's the savior of the world, 1 John 4, 14. You know, he died for, he's propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2, verse 2. Uh, talks about, I think it's in uh, John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, you know, God so loved the world. There's John 12, 47, you know, he, again, he's the savior of the world. So it, it just all throughout the scripture, so they'll, go lip, they'll give lip service to that, but they'll deny it in their doctrine. So, their argument in favor of limited atonement basically goes like this. So they'll basically say that, well, uh, Jesus Christ could not have died for everybody because that means everybody would be saved. So their faulty argument is that since not everybody is saved, that means Jesus Christ didn't die for everybody. I mean, this is, this is a very weak argument at best. And the reason why it's weak is because uh, no one who ever teaches the unlimited atonement ever says that just because Jesus Christ died for everybody means everybody is saved. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, Jesus Christ died for and bought the false prophets, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But they're still damned, according to 2 Peter 2, verse 3. Okay? Calvinists will argue that God damning to hell those whom Christ died for would be unjust, but the problem with this line of thinking is that it makes salvation by justice instead of by God's grace. The scriptures clearly teach, and they repeatedly teach, by the way, too, that salvation and justification is by God's grace. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 2, Romans 5, verse 15 down to verse 21, Ephesians 1, verse 6 to 7, Ephesians 2, verse 5 to 9, Titus 2, verse 11 to 12, Titus 3, verse 7 to 8, and many others too. And salvation and grace is a free gift from God. You can see that in Romans 5, verse 15 to 18, Romans 6, 23, and Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. Grace and justice are not always the same thing. Okay, the Calvinist heresy of limited atonement is based on a faulty premise that the elect are born with their sin debt already paid for. And although they're not saved yet because God hasn't given them faith, the Calvinist argument they will use to justify this is they'll, they'll basically have an eisegesis type view of Colossians 2.14. So let's actually go to the text. This is the verse they like using. Colossians 2.14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So they take this one verse out of context, and they build this whole, whole false theology off this one verse. This is what Calvinism does. You'll see this a lot with Calvinism, is they'll take a, a select few verses, and they'll build this huge doctrine off, like a few out of context proof texts. And then beyond that, like beyond these couple of, of isolated proof texts, they got very little, they basically have no leg to stand on, because all their reading of scripture is based around their, their viewing of these these like select few verses they like taking. So like I said, the problem with Calvinism is they have these key doctrines that are based off one verse or a couple of verses out of context. Nowhere does Colossians 2.14 say or even imply or teach or imply to even teach that the elect are born with their sin debt already paid for when they believe. Okay. The problem is that and how you know this is because Colossians 2.13, the verse before it, talks about Christ's blood forgiving you, forgiving all your trespasses. And Paul is writing this to save people, okay? There would be no need for forgiveness if the elect were already born with their sin debt already paid for, because forgiveness implies that the sin debt is still there. There's nothing left that needs to be forgiven if this debt's already been paid for. In scripture, debt is never used to illustrate the nature of the atonement, it's used to illustrate the nature of forgiveness, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter six, verse 12. Let's go there, Matthew chapter six, verse 12. It says, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Matthew, cha or Matthew chapter 18, verse number 27 says, then the, Lord, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Okay, we see the thing of debt being connected with forgiveness. Also, uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 4. Another verse in the matter, Luke chapter 11, verse Four. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted, indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Also kind of refutes the Calvinistic error that God causes sin, but a bit of a side issue. Okay, forgiveness means the debt is still there. 
It doesn't mean that, see the fact we're having to have forgiveness is mean, means that it's still there. So using this faulty argument from Colossians 2.14, see again, they're basing the whole thing off one verse and ignoring and not comparing the scripture with scripture and they're ignoring other verses that teach contrary. So like I said, forgiveness means the debt is still there. Matthew chapter six, verse 14 to 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Simple as that. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 down to verse 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till, till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. We see this thing again, forgiveness being busy debt, and then busy, busy essentially forgiveness meaning the sin is still there, the error is still there. So again, there's no need for forgiveness if their debt has already been paid for. Matthew chapter 18, verse 35 says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Why would they have to forgive them their trespasses if there wasn't if it wasn't still there, basically? See, that's the whole thing these Calvinists will ignore. Some other scriptures on the, some other verses on the matter also uh, include Matthew chapter nine verse six, Luke chapter seventeen verse three to four, Luke chapter eleven verse four, and Luke chapter twenty three verse thirty four. And again, other scriptures that teach that forgiveness of sins is not unconditional is also First John chapter one verse seven to nine, Acts chapter twenty six verse eighteen down to verse twenty, and Acts chapter three verse nineteen. So, this argument of limited atonement that well, uh, their debts already been paid for, and that Jesus Christ could not have died for everybody because it makes the atonement because it means that everybody is saved. It's faulty at best and rooted in eisegesis, which is what Calvinism is. Calvinism again stems from Catholicism, and both these religions in turn come from Gnosticism, which okay, their whole teaching of Scripture is rooted in just their inserting their own heresy into the text. And just taking obscure verses out of context and not looking at the whole of scripture and comparing verses. Their whole the whole reading of scripture is based around these these couple of verses. And if verses don't seem to line up, they'll just ignore them pretty much. So anyway, don't be deceived by Calvinism. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.